This conversation is taking place at the DuPont Environmental Center in the Russell W. Peterson Wildlife Refuge. We're talking today at the DuPont Environmental Education Center in uh, South Wilmington. And we're talking with Dr. Bernard Sweeney, the director, president, and CEO of the Stroud Water Research Center. Oh, I see you have a mayfly. mayfly. <laughs> My mayfly tie, <laughs> yes. Now, a, lo a lot of what you do has to do with bugs, right? I mean, That's bugs right. in the rivers and the streams. Yeah. Talk about that and, and, and maybe the thing that you guys invented, the leaf pack. Yeah, and how, yeah. how not only scientists, but ordinary folks can get involved in determining whether the, the, the brook or the stream that runs near their house is, is good. Yeah, so um, if you wanted to figure out whether a, the stream in your backyard was clean or not, you could go in and, and, and study the heck out of the chemistry of it uh, every day for 365 days and get a fairly good feeling for how, how it was. But if you really want to know how clean it is, you go in and look at what's living in it. And with enough background information as to what should be living in there, you look at what is living there, and relative to what should be there, you get a gauge of how clean that particular stream or river is. And, and one of the best groups of animals to do that with are aquatic insects, uh, because the insects are very abundant in streams. So a typical stream around here, like the Christina River, and just a chunk of the Christina River might have 300 to 400 different species of, of aquatic insects living in it. And each one of those species has a different tolerance for pollution and a different sensitivity for different pollutants. And so by looking at the kinds of things that are living there and their abundance, they tell us how clean the water is. Uh, and what we find is that it's very quick so, uh, and it's very accurate. And the nice thing about it is that they'll tell you what's happening not only on the day that you go in and, and look at them, but the fact that they're uh, you know, anywhere from six months to two years old, they tell you what's been happening in that stream or river for the last six months or two years. Whereas if you go in and do the chemistry, it tells you how clean that river is at that moment in time. So there could have been a, a slug of pesticides come down that river the day before, but it's gone and you're not gonna be able to test for it. But if the bugs that are sensitive to that pesticide are gone, and they should be there, then you can go to court and say with fair certainty that this stream has been contaminated by that pesticide. On the other hand, if you have a bug there that is very sensitive to a chemical like say atrazine, and you find a bunch of them, then you can, st you can state very uh, unequivocally that that stream has not been exposed to atrazine for the last, well, however old that bug is. And if it's a year old, last year. You can't do that with chemicals. Well, so what's atrazine? I mean, why? Atrazine is a pesticide they okay. use for okay. corn, yeah. Um, and so as scientists, we use uh, these kind of surveys, the aquatic insects, the fish and all, to, to gauge the health of the, of the stream or river. Now those are costly and uh, expensive and you need a lot of uh, expert equipment and people. Um, we've been working on a, on a project with uh, middle school and high school kids called the Leaf Pack experiment. And that's where we take a, um, and, and this is a, an experiment to try to let students gauge the health of a stream or river themselves in an afternoon with very low tech equipment. So what they do is they, they'll get a, a, um, a mesh bag that you would get in the supermarket for, with onions in it and take the onions out of it and fill it with leaves, leaves from trees that are growing next to a stream. Put the bag in the river pin it to the bottom of the river and leave it there for four weeks. Come back in four weeks and pull the bag out, open it up and take a look at what's inside it. Well, what's inside it are all the critters that live in the stream that eat leaves. And there are hundreds of them, hundreds of different types. And based on, again, the kinds and abundance of critters that they find in that onion bag eating those leaves, they can actually calculate a water quality score and what we've been doing in the last five years is trying to calibrate that simple middle school, high school approach with professional water quality surveys. And the correlation looks really good. In other words, you might not be able to go to court with it, but if you're at a stinky stream and the professionals are saying it's stinky, then your leaf packs are gonna say, this is a stinky stream. And, and, and wash your hands after getting into it or or go take a swim in it. So, so we think it's a pretty good, it's an exciting project because it not only can 
let the students and, uh, and lay people gauge their own water quality in their own backyard, but it engages them in, in, the, in the idea of the whole watershed and the whole concept of water quality and how different land use affects water quality. So we're really excited about it. And we have, we have aspirations at the leaf pack kit, which we do here in the Christina River, which we do in the Mid-Atlantic region, is gonna become a global education program that's gonna engage millions of people throughout the world in terms of uh, preserving clean, fresh water. A couple of weeks ago, you opened a brand new building. Um, Talk about that a little bit. Why, why, why did you have to build a new building and, 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 and explain how special this building really is? Well, we did. We op on May 30th, we opened a brand new uh, environmental education building. It's called the Moorhead Environmental Complex. And uh, we did that because we were out of space. Uh, we did it because we have postdocs and graduate students that have offices and stairways and uh, dormers and stuff like that, and, and, and some graduate students don't even have an office, and we have scientists that are, that are working uh, two, three, four in a, in a single office. And so we did it out of uh, necessity, uh, which is good. And, and as, uh, as our chairman of the board said, that was a high-class problem. We had a lot of work, and a lot of people were interested in fresh water, and we needed more space. So we did it out of necessity. And, you know, three years ago when we decided that we had to do this, um, normally what we would do is we would raise the money ahead of time and then build the building, but we needed space then and, and at that moment. So we borrowed the money hoping that we could engage the public in, in, in a campaign to pay for it and just went ahead and built the building. Well, then there was two decisions to be made. One is what kind of building do you, do you put up and what can you afford to put up? And uh, we could have put up a really um, modest um, uh, rather um, environmental, environmentally unfriendly building that would have been cheaper and uh, not very attractive and not really an educational tool. But we decided to put up a LEED certified building. Um, and we decided that we wanted to be a leader in energy and, uh, and development. Uh, and we wanted a building that would actually uh, exude the mission of the Stroud Water Research Center, which is environmental. Uh, we wanted a building that when all was said and done after we built this much, this, this significant building, that our environmental footprint was actually less than before we started. And lastly, the campus. the campus. And we wanted a building that would really um, be an education program unto itself, that we would bring students, teachers, lay public to, and that by just going through the building, spending an hour going through the building, they would actually leave that building, leave our campus, with a better awareness of how you can actually uh, reduce your environmental footprint in terms of energy, water use, and so on and so forth, and take home with them to their houses examples of how they, what they could do in their own home as best management practice. And so we took that approach, and, uh, and we didn't look back. And, and it is an exciting building. We have, you know, everything in that building has a story to it from the paints that we use, to the insulation that we use, to the solar panels on the, on the ceiling, to the wetland treatment system, to the types of windows we put in, the, in, in, the, in each office, uh, the carpet that's on the floor. It's all um, a terrific story that we can't wait to um, convey to the public because we think it'll make a difference. We think, that, we think that the building is exciting to everybody now, but we think that that building is gonna be like garden variety building 10 years from now, that all those things that we put in that building if we, if we educate the public, will become standard practice in, in the building industry 10 years from now. Uh, so we're, we're, we're very excited about it. Thanks, Bern. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're connected with Content Delaware.